Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, including our dear friends from the Rotary, meet and uh, meet the Dutch coordinators and volunteers, colleagues. And last but not least, our new batch of MSC students. My name is Charlotte de Fertile. I'm the Vice Rector of IHDO and I'm responsible for the academic affairs. Uh, it's my pleasure to wish you all of you a very warm welcome uh, to this annual event to mark the start of the new academic year at IHDO. We have a very full house, which is, uh, I think nearly all of the seats are, are uh, actually uh, taken, so it's a very good sign. So today we are gathered here uh, to welcome uh, 162 new students, which is quite a high number, coming from 46 different countries. So to you new students, most of you, you arrived less than a week ago on Sunday. Um, for some of you, or for many of you, it might be the first time in Europe, and I'm very pleased that you choose to come to IG Del to do your Masters. Welcome to Del. I would like to extend a very special welcome to those representing the embassies of the countries of our students' origin. So, 27 embassies are represented here today. Uh, I'm very happy that you could take the time for your busy schedule to share this special moment with us here in Europe. For you, new students, this event ma ma marks the official start of an exciting journey uh, here in Delft, which hopefully will lead to you earning an MC degree in April 2021. Over the past few days, you have started to settle in, and everything is of course still new and exciting, uh, maybe except for the weather, uh, but, and, but be assured that staff at IG Dell will do their utmost best, best to make you feel welcome and at home, and ensure that you can take the maximum benefit of your stay here in Delft. You have the unique opportunity of not only learning about water and benefiting from the wealth of uh, water knowledge here at IG and, and, and in Delft and in the Netherlands, but you will also be learning uh, about other cultures and doing things that are outside of your comfort zone and hopefully to grow as a person as a result. We are a small institute and compared to the larger institutes, our staff-student ratio is relatively high. 
That means that we can give a personal touch to our educational program. You will get to know the teaching staff, uh, and uh, not only in the classroom, and the support staff, not only in the classroom, but also, um, and, and also not only at the reception or the IT help desk, but also in the canteen at lunchtime, uh, in the corridor, and you will have the opportunity to interact outside of the, the classroom as well uh, at social and sports events. I would like to take this opportunity to highlight one of the unique features of this institute, which I'm very proud of. Of course, most of you know us as the institute is water education. And of course, which we are. We are a, a, an institute of, for water in education. And we are also proud to be the largest international graduate water, water education facility in the world. We are proud, of course, of our achievement of our alumni who are making an impact on water challenges in, in their countries. And uh, later we will have a, an excellent example of that. But we should be at least as proud of our diversity. That is, diversity in discipline, diversity in nationalities and cultures. Addressing complex water challenges requires looking at them from different angles, uh, from different perspectives, and, and listening to different uh, viewpoints. An ecologist has a different perspective on water challenges than, say, social scientists or engineers. And they differ, again, from water technologists, biologists, chemists. We usually attend talks or conferences in our own specialization. And actually, quite often, we hear the things that we already know, or more or less know. So, I would like to encourage you strongly to attend lunch seminars, guest lectures, and, 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 and other, and choose electives in modules, uh, electives in topics, others than in your own specialization, outside of your own specialization. There, uh, you, you, you may learn something new and, and unexpected, that may enrich your, special, your own specialization. There are many examples of innovation that are triggered by combining different disciplines. So I hope you take this unique opportunity to uh, uh, benefit from this richness of disciplines here at IG. But our diversity is actually much more than just a broad range of water disciplines and professional backgrounds. As said, Today we welcome new students from 46 countries and the total student and alumni population spans actually 190 countries. 190 countries. This building is probably one of the uh, few places in the world with, with so high uh, number of different uh, nationalities and cultures per square meter. Make use of it. I, I, I think I can easily say that. But make use of it. Embrace it and enjoy it. Celebrate this diversity. It is, of course, tempting to stick with your your uh, your uh, as as a, together as a, as a group of students from your own country. You speak the same language, you have the same culture, uh, and and of course that's important when you're settling in uh, into a new environment. However, I would like to encourage you, while you have this unique opportunity to connect to others from different uh, countries and cultures. Forge new friendships with those from other countries. Doing classes, uh, but also doing lunch, coffee breaks, in the canteen, group exercises, or even while walking and cycling home. Because an international network of water professionals is probably one of the most precious assets that you can gain from the time here at ICDO. So new students, I wish you a very fruitful and enjoyable time here at Aikido. I would like now to invite Dr. Joanna Popescu to the stage. Dr. Popescu is Associate Professor in Hydroinformatics. She's not only an established research in this, researcher in this field, but she's an excellent teacher and she happens also to be an alumni from Aikido. She will now share some of her experience, uh, her professional experience and insights. The title of her presentation is Water Aid in Our Pockets. So please, Joanna, the stage is yours.
Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, and uh, students. I'm going to talk about the uh, help that we have in our pocket and how can some of us use it in our daily work. But first, let me show you, as it was already mentioned, that you are coming from all over the world to study in a new country. And this is your first day of study. And when one would come to study in a new country, what would you do first? You would buy things, something like you do at home, like food or a new subscription to the phone or clothes. But you will also need to do things that are specific to this country. And it was already mentioned, you will need to buy a bike and you definitely need an umbrella. We have seen that already in the days that have passed. And I have decided to talk about the phone and how can phone help uh, professionals in their work in water. But first, let's see what you will use, and you know already what you are using the phone for uh, in a, your daily uh, work. So you will talk home because you will miss home. You will do a lot of photos wherever you go. You will buy things, even tickets to go back and visit your family. But mostly you will talk with your friends and with your colleagues, and you will share the whiteboard and the formulas on the whiteboard, and you will always check if in the next half an hour will it rain or not. <laughs> in water, it is also a very good uh, support because we can collect data, we can see uh, what is a rainfall, we can see uh, water quality data, and we can measure land use, water levels, water velocities. And this is what I'm going to talk with you. And before going there, let's look a bit on what type of instruments are there to collect data. And traditionally, they are expensive, and they are very good, but expensive. So citizens get the chance to help all the uh, scientists, the policy makers, and the decision makers by collecting data with their own phone. And this is called crowdsourcing. You'll see many other names, but mainly it is like that. It's simple. It's data abundant. It's low cost. By complementing, of course, it's low cost only if you don't lose your phone during these uh, events. And it creates awareness uh, in, with the citizens. And when I talk about awareness, I'm also referring to the fact that we all know that we have sustainable development goals where we do want to have to take care about the planet and to have a better life for uh, the inhabitants of the planet. And that translates into the 17 sustainable development goals to which citizens would not only be aware, but they would also contribute to the measurement of the indicators and to make it better. Here at IG, there are several staff members that are working with phone technologies in their research. And these are the staff members that are working, the MSc students and the PhD fellows that are using it in studies, in projects, and we even include it in one of the modules in the curriculum. When did we start it? We started relatively new in 2005 when there were only mobile phones there with advice services, uh, with SMSs. And as technology evolved in 2008, there was a peak of uh, mobile phones used. Then it evolved even more and then uh, smartphones started to be used. And so did our uh, projects. They evolved and they were using uh, technologies in the studies. I'm in particular going to talk with you about four of the projects that were implemented and uh, researched at IG, and with more emphasis on the last one, which is uh, fairly new. So two of our, uh, my colleagues looked at uh, measuring water levels and if we can prove that water levels can be uh, measured and uh, shown to uh, professionals. So there were several uh, gorges uh, in and they were mapped on the map and the citizens could send SMS messages that were recorded and then whenever you would click on one of these gorges you can see what is the water level in a canal and it had the advantage that you can do that on the field or in the office. And that was in 2008. Later on in 2015, the aim was to map the extent of rainfall by uh, also using the information sent by citizens and how can this be done by uh, 
in laboratory uh, recording videos of a rainfall event, and these are the uh, results of recording video. And then these were available on an app, on a mobile phone. And uh, a citizen going in the field will send its location, his or her location, and then it will also map, uh, map it to which one of the videos it looks, and if there is enough particip participation, everyone could see what is the extent of the rainfall effect. Then later on, two colleagues were looking on and uh, developing uh, applications on the mobile phone for collecting um, precipitation, evaporation, and water levels on Mara Serengeti. And there also, the data was sent to a server, and then wherever data was available, a user can look at uh, what is available, can see the rainfall, can see the water level, and how this can be used. It can inform uh, professionals on using it for water allocation planning and for looking at environmental flow. And further, later on, we were using the uh, mobile phones to uh, look at um, decision support and to how models which incorporate data coming from citizens can give uh, expert um, advice to uh, decision uh, makers. Decision and professionals will build a model that will show what is the situation in the field, especially with focus on floods. And floods are much, a lot of data um, demanding uh, models. And they will put a lot of data in the model, but also they will need the input for the citizen to check certain um, situation in the field. And I will be more specific when uh, I will give you the examples. I want to uh, tell you how like that, citizens become the eye of the policy makers. Four specific applications were developed in the uh, project for the citizens to go in groups and to measure data related to water depth, water velocity, and also land use, but I will focus on, on these two. And three of them were specifically for citizens to explore, to measure, and collaborate, and one was for authorities who were launching these campaigns and asking the citizens to come and to give data uh, to check what they are doing. Two case studies were selected to prove the concept, and one is a rural wetland area in Romania, which is an um, area where there is a lot of duplicate network of canals, uh, where uh, flood is actually not a hazard, it's a service for the fauna and flora that it is in that area. And the second case study is very close to the city of Athens uh, in Greece, where it is highly ur urbanized and floods are a problem. What has been done, in, I will take each case one by one. The first case, the Daniel Delta, uh, the professionals and our uh, PhD students were looking at a model that will show based on classical existing data what is happening there and then identify where are uh, places with water stagnation, which is not good, where there are velocities or um, where are canals that are not connected. And based on that, authorities will call for the citizens to go on the field and to measure inside the field what is happening and then coming back and see if this is what is really happening. But also testing if truly a citizen with a phone can help uh, this um, work. A model has been built that was showing all the flow of, uh, of the water in the delta and then specific paths that citizens will follow and points where uh, water level and water velocity is measured were defined. And our champion is here. All the students, and hopefully she's also in the room with you, all the citizens could select themselves what they want to measure, velocity or uh, water level. And this is not an easy task. They were going in boats and staying in the boats six to eight hours. It's not easy, so they were very much committed to help and to see what is happening there. Um, as soon as a, a point of interest is reached, then the two boats, one on the left bank and one on the right bank, was, um, were uh, stopping. 
then torches were put in the water and the tennis ball was thrown in order to uh, measure the velocity. We were collecting back the uh, tennis ball. We were not letting them in the water. Let me show you a bit how the results are. Uh, there are many good results, but when you go with a lot of people in the field, there are many bad results. Not because the citizens do not want to collect good data, but because there are birds that are very nice around, and they are better to uh, make a photo of a bird uh, rather than uh, of the dodge. But in time, they learn that it is better to pay attention and to uh, make good photos. Uh, when we talk about velocities, uh, the ball is thrown in the water, then a video is made and based on uh, certain uh, parameters, so the velocity at the surface of the water is determined. Here also the citizens were so enthusiastic that sometimes instead of standing still and making the video, they were moving together with the phone as the ball was moving. But there is always room for improvement. How is this data used? Just to uh, show you how is this data uh, used, then uh, inside uh, all the data that was collected by the citizen in order to prove the concept, we also measured with traditional data what is happening in the field. And we could say that citizens can prove that there are places where uh, all the data is correct and the model can be used as it is, but there are also places where the geometry of the river has to be changed. And that is uh, potentially a good thing. If I now go to the city of Athens, I will show you a totally different application where citizens were taking uh, site photos at the river on the riverbanks and many uh, from one position taking many site photos and then repeating the cycle many times. And this is our master student who did and developed an algorithm from these site photos to determine the cross section of a river. And I have selected three. Um, cross sections to show you, because it's a proof of concept, that with this green dotted line you can actually show that the cross section of the river was determined in a correct way, and there is potential to go and to determine an irregular cross section uh, of a river. Now, that is just a glimpse of what we are doing and we are working, but what I would like that you take with you is that technology is there to help us in our work. And it also evolved. We should not stick with one technology. We should be flexible to adapt because as technology evolves, so does our abil ability to involve others and to do more. So be open to learn something new, always. Then let me travel with you forward in time to your last day. As you have heard, I also have been a student many, many years back as I stayed in the uh, auditorium and listen to the lectures, and I can tell you a few things from that perspective. I can share you some things from that perspective. A um, few weeks back, I was visiting a wonder of engineering work in water, the Panama Canal, and there at the Panama Canal, which keeps the world united, as Panamanians are saying, and they are uh, right, there is a photo of all the people who contributed to the realization of the canal. These people, the photo is from more than 100 years ago, and all those are rightfully called canal heroes. What I want to show you that while I was reading, I was thinking that only a few words can be changed and it will fit perfectly to IHE alumni. So IHE alumni came from all over the, from many different places to learn to build their future that will benefit, hopefully, the world. And they made friends for life, and they could, with what they have learned, to contribute and exalted the country at their return. But what I want you to take very much, and it was already stressed here, is that they came from different parts of the world, they spoke different languages, but they all managed to understand each other. And this is what you will see that it is happening here when you will do your life. Will it be difficult in the year, in the uh, months to come with a lot of work? Yes, it will be difficult. But I advise you every now and then to make a break, go to see a museum, go to take a walk, even if it is raining very much. It will help you uh, in your studies. 
will you make friends for life? As it was said, yes, you will make friends for life. Not only that you will make friends for life, you will learn so much about other countries that you never knew. And you will be surprised to discover things about your own country that you took for granted. But you will present it to your friends, and then you will see how wonderful it is. You will see other cultures. But most of all, what you will see is that everyone in the world is the same. They all have hopes. They all came here to learn. They all miss homes. They all like music. So this is why you will make friends with them. And when you will go back home, because you have these friends, maybe you will manage better water because you will see what is happening to the others. Will you be a better water professional? That's for you, for each one of you to answer this question. But I can tell you what the ones graduating this year in April were saying about the water. They were saying that water should be addressed from different mm -hmm. perspectives as it was also mentioned before, so that's very good. And it does not have border. And how can we address that through cooperation in an interdisciplinary approach? So you should not leave anyone uh, out. You should look at the policy makers, at the decision makers, at engineers, at the, uh, all uh, aspects uh, in water. And uh, the last question, is when will you go back home? Will you miss Aichi? Well, I did a bit of a search in the social media to see if you will miss or not Aichi. Yes, you will miss it. You even might consider to give to your kids the name Delfiana. <laughs> yes, so you will miss it. And um, this is what I wanted to talk with you about. Welcome at Aichi Dals and enjoy your studies. sharing these really nice perspectives and uh, also in your own time as, as, as an alumni here that long time ago. Uh, but I'm also looking very different now to uh, tennis balls and, and my phone. <laughs> I've seen very different uses of it now. Uh, so now it's time for a musical interlude. And it is my pleasure to introduce a very special musical interlude performed by two Talented musicians who also happen to be MSC students here. Please, a warm applause for two of our senior MSC participants, Daniel Tausend from Jamaica and Martin Wells from Granada, who are very really nice.
that was really great. Thank you, Danielle from Jamaica and Maxine from Granada. I, I really enjoy it. And I, hearing from the reactions, I think everybody did enjoy this interview. <laughs> now, last year they were sitting here, probably like you, new students. So uh, I'm just that makes you wonder who will perform here uh, <laughs> next year. I, I heard already some singing, so, so maybe, but, uh, no, no pressure. Uh, I, would, I would like to invite Maria Laura, the, uh, Laura, the alumni officer, and she will introduce the alumni award and the winner. I, should I sing or should I start? <laughs> so, distinguished guests, uh, alumni that are following this uh, ceremony live stream, uh, colleagues, and of course, all the students. Well, I would like to congratulate all new students on the commencement of their studies at IHDL. No? Yes. But uh, today, apart from the opening of the academic year, it's a special day because we celebrate the Alumni Day. And uh, why? Because many professionals uh, have started their studies at IEG, at UNESCO IEG, and now at IEG, like you, one day in October. And many also with a walking tour and a boat trip and this moment. IHDELF, I think that you have heard in these days that it uh, has more than 23,000 alumni worldwide and they form the biggest water professional network in the world. They are, you many know about that, our best ambassadors, even though I get to know today that we have a student that has a father that is an alumni. You are not the first one. Uh, in this ceremony, we have the pleasure of award, awarding one of our exceptional alumnus that will receive the seventh IEG Delft Alumni Award. The award is given annually to an alumna or an alumnus who has proven to be a role model for other water professionals. Twenty-seven nominations were received this year, and the jury members were very impressed over here, with the overall quality of their work and their proposals. <coughs> Three alumni made up a very strong showlist, and they were Dr. Rose Kawa from Uganda, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Masum Handar from Afghanistan. Also, former staff member he was, and Mr. Bondimu Tekle Sito from Ethiopia. <laughs> so, congratulations to all of them, and now I would like to give the word to our vice rector to announce the alumni award of this year. It's my pleasure to announce the winner, and that is uh, Professor Alvaro Karma Vaz. So, I mean, I mean uh, congratulations. Which, uh, <laughs> it's also my honor to deliver the laudatio and explain a little bit on uh, why you received this, this uh, award. Uh, Professor Alvaro Barmarquez uh, Vaz is uh, from Mozambique. Uh, I would like to highlight some of his achievements and explain why he is really the deserving winner uh, of, this, of, of the Outstanding Alumni Award, uh, which, as Maria Laura already explained, is, is given to I, every year to IG alumni who made an, an, a lasting impact on the water sector. Well, I mean, as I said, I was looking at a long list of achievements, and, and where, where shall I start, actually? Out of this long list, I would like to pick the, and I'm emphasize the achievements uh, to highlight what Professor 
uh, Colonel Bass has done to share his knowledge and support the young uh, generation of water professionals in, in Mozambique. After graduated, uh, graduating from Aichi in river engineering in 1981 uh, and obtaining his PhD in, uh, in hydrology and water resources in Portugal, he has had a long distinguished academic career uh, at Eduardo Mondlane University where he actually created a master degree in hydraulics and water resources. At the same time, he was, I, I don't know how you can do that at the same time, but he did that at the same time, he was also a founding partner of Consultec, and that's a leading consultancy firm in Mozambique. And both at the university and both at the, uh, at the, uh, the, the consultancy, he worked with and he stimulated young graduates to become better professional. And also to continue uh, on to postgraduate studies. He's also the founding, again, also, he's also a founding member of AquaShare, the Mozambican Association of Water Professionals, which is also very active uh, working with young professionals and promoting their international contacts and uh, experience. In his position as uh, head, sorry, his position as head of department and dean at the university, at the Mondana, Eduard Mondana University, he sent his best junior staff to IT for uh, their master's degree. And, and some of them are now themselves associate or, or assistant professors at, at the university. Others are working in, uh, else, uh, in, uh, elsewhere in the, in the water sector, in the private sector or public sector. He also sent his young, the, the young bright graduates uh, from the National Water and Directorate to pursue their masters at IIT. So we are very grateful for all the bright uh, uh, master students we, we received from, uh, from Mozambique. And after which also they also obtained key pos positions in the, in the water sector. His students and young people he worked with during the long career all, uh, are now working all over Mozambique and, and beyond. Some of them in positions of high responsibility, and they all refer to him with great respect and affection. Professor Carmel Bass uh, has worked extensively on shared uh, international river basins. He also wrote a textbook on hydrology and water resources used in universities uh, in, in Mozambique, Angola, Portugal, and other Portuguese uh, speaking countries. The only reason is that we are not using it is because it's in Portuguese. <laughs> this is only a very small sample of uh, the impressive list of uh, achievement of uh, Professor Carlos. There is really no doubt that he is one of the most visionary and most professional water uh, experts in southern Africa, in the South African region, and absolutely a worthy winner of the alumni award of 2000, uh, IG Alum alumni award of 2019. Uh, furthermore, after Mozambique experienced the largest flood on record following two tropical uh, cyclones that, that recently hit uh, the country, it's uh, a perfect occasion to uh, honor one of the most prominent uh, water scientists of Mozambique uh, with the IIT Alumni Award. Uh, Professor Carmen de Vaz, uh, I would like you to re remind you, we'll also deliver a lunchtime seminar tomorrow. So you're all invited uh, to, to, to that lunch seminar. But for now, I would like to invite uh, Johan and, of course, Professor Carmel Bass to the stage. Vice Director of IHG, Professor Charlotte de Fritte, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, friends, dear 
students. It is a great honor for me to receive this award. I am even more pleased with it due to the special role that IHE in the Netherlands cooperation had in my career as a university professor, a researcher, and a consultant in the fields of hydraulic engineering, hydrology, and water resources management. To understand that special role, allow me to say something about what happened to Mozambique in the 1970s. I graduated in civil engineering in 1972 at the University of Lorenzo Marx, our national university and the only one that existed at that time. My area of work was structural design of high-rise buildings and bridges. I lectured these subjects at university and simultaneously did some design work as a consultant. Then in 1975, Mozambique became independent and this historic event caused a massive departure of Portuguese people, creating an enormous problem for the functioning of public institutions, private enterprises, schools and hospitals, with the risk of collapse of the state. All the young people that had some qualifications were called for positions of responsibility in spite of the lack of experience. And the gap in the areas that the new government considered most important had to be closed. One of the areas with an enormous lack of qualified staff was water resources management and hydraulic infrastructures. Whereas most civil engineers were in the fields of structures, roads and railways, or in construction. The few working in the water field were almost all doing water supply. The government had plans to build two large dams, continue with the hydrological work, and start negotiations with the neighboring countries on water sharing and management in the many international river basins on which Mozambique is dependent. And so, I was asked to leave my field of structural design and start working in hydrology, water resources management, and hydraulic infrastructure areas where I do next to nothing. While continuing to lecture at the university, I started giving a hand to the newly created DNA, the National Directorate of Water. And that's where I first met the Dutch who start arriving to lend support to DNA. Uh, and I'm very pleased to see here some friendly faces, but especially um, Professor Hubert Savanay, my dear friend, who on arrival immediately had his name changed to the Portuguese Umberto, <laughs> which is now he is still called whenever he comes to Maputo to meet old friends. The Dutch people at DNA taught us a lot not by being a kind of distant professors, but by working with us, side by side, as if they were also Mozambicans. This identification with us, the willing acceptance that the country lacked so many things that we were used to, is something that we keep in our hearts and shall never forget. At the same time, in the last years of the 1970s, we started receiving at university professors from the Netherlands to a cooperation program managed by NAFIT. And this led my university to ask for scholarships in the Netherlands for some of our mm -hmm. junior lectures at that time to do our postgraduate studies in water. The first, the first to arrive at IHE was Mr. Jean Salomon, who became Minister of Construction and Water a few years later. I was the next uh, Mozambican to succeed him here at, at, at IHE, not, not as a minister. <laughs> <laughs> I arrived in Delft together with my wife, who worked at DNA, in September 1980. Both of us with scholarships from NAFIC to study at IHE. She was in hydrology and I in hydraulic engineering. Those 11 months that we stayed in Delft were one of the best periods of our lives and not only because both of us graduated with distinction. <laughs> it was the excellent teaching that was provided, the learning environment at our disposal, the facilities for research when we were doing our thesis. But it was also the contact with colleagues from so many other countries, from other continents, that enriched our lives. 
It was the field trips in this country and in other countries of Europe, not only to watch fantastic things like the Delta Works or special water facilities, but also to see the tulips in the Hilton of Naples. It was the general friend friendliness at IHG and at the city of Delft. And last but not least, the parties and the beer, <laughs> which uh, compensated, well, almost, the weeks and weeks of grey weather without a glimpse of the sun that we take for granted in Mozambique. Since my education at IHG, I have continued to work in hydrology, water resources management, and hydraulic infrastructure until recently when I retired as I'm already 70 years old. Even though the major part of my work was in lecturing and research at the university, I kept my co collaboration with DNA, especially on the issue of water sharing agreements in international river basins. You may be aware that this, this issue in Mozambique, like in the Netherlands, is quite serious. 50% of our territory lies in these basins. More than 50% of our water resources flows through our western border and we are located downstream of eight of the nine basins that we share with neighboring countries. I refer to an episode that occurred in 1983. Most of the Southern Africa region was under a severe drought and our capital city, Maputo, had extreme restrictions in its water supply. We had to ask Swaziland, which is upstream of Mozambique in the Umbaluzi Basin, to release more water from its dam. The request was supported by the technical work done at DNA by Professor Sadane and by myself, and was successful. In less than a year after it, as we were starting to recover from the drought, a devastating cyclone hit Swaziland and Mozambique. And Professor Sadane, Umberto, and other colleagues from Holland did not limit themselves to hydrological calculations. They went out there to the submerged areas with their boats and helped in the process of rescuing people. The 80s were a tragic decade in Mozambique due to the civil war that brought death and destruction at such a scale that we are now, almost 30 years after its end, still living with the consequences. Much of what we had achieved after independence in areas like rural water supply or the hydrometric network was destroyed or had to be abandoned. An enormous effort was made in the following decades to recover the hydraulic and water management facilities. I took part in this effort led by DNA and saw the crucial role of the support given by the Netherlands to our water sector. In the past 30 years, much has been achieved in water management in Mozambique in spite of the difficulties. There were great advances with the water law, a modern water policy, new and better institutional arrangements, a continuous increase of the agrometric network, <coughs> joint studies of shared river basin, more endogenous knowledge, and especially more people trained in the field. We achieved also important agreements with the countries of SADC, the Southern Africa Development Community. I am proud to have been part of Mozambique's effort that led to the signing of the SADC Protocol on Shared River Basins and of the so-called Revised Protocol. In this work, I renewed my connections with IHG, with Professor Sadane and Peter van der Zag, which provided the opportunity for my collaboration in the UNESCO PCCP program. Now that you presented me with this prestigious award, I want to express my deep and heartfelt gratitude to my country, Mozambique, that gave me the opportunity to study at IHG and to work during almost 40 years in this field that I love. To IHG for all that you have given me during my stay in the 80s, and that built the foundation of the career that I developed. To all my colleagues, Mozambican and Dutch, that guided and helped and stimulated me, and by doing that, allowed me to achieve so much. Thank you.
thank you, Professor Carol Buff, for your kind and inspiring uh, works. Your Excellencies, honored guests, colleagues, and of course the new students of the IHC Delft in the batch 2019 and 2021. My name is uh, Johan van Dijk. I'm the business director of the Institute. And may I also wish you a warm welcome to IHC Delft. You, the new students, have now become the members of the IHC Delft community. And on our website, you will find that as a mission, we strengthen the institutional capacities in the water sector for global development. We argue that this is not only a noble task, but also that it is challenging and becoming ever more urgent this time. And the good news is, of course, that you are here and that you are participating in this important challenge. You made a choice of study and enrolled in one of our master programs. And what I would like to do now is to give you already an insight into the world after graduation. The examples I will present are taken from the agendas of four groups of possible future employers, either in your own country or region, or internationally. And these are the government, university, or a knowledge institute, civil society, NGO, and the private company. First, the government. If we look, for example, at the Water Sector Performance Report 2019 that was prepared by the government of Uganda, we clearly see the interlinkages between the various disciplines that relate to the water sector. The chapters in this report refer to urban and rural water supply, sanitation and hygiene, water for production, water resources management, wetlands management, and most of these sound familiar, but there are also chapters on climate change, good governance activities, environmental support services, the interaction with civil society, and many more cross-cutting themes. Then the university. A recent report from the United Nations University on higher education in the water sector mentions capacity development as a critical component for progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals, and Sustainable Development Goal number six on water and sanitation in particular. The report underlines that the nature of the capacities that are currently required is rapidly changing. Already in 2030, some 70% of the workforce will be in occupations that cannot be predicted accurately today. Also in the water sector, an increasing demand will be placed on non-technical interpersonal skills, such as leadership, ability to interact, coordinate, lead, and to have fluency of ideas, as it is called in this report. Then civil society. One of the large and internationally operating NGOs in the field of water is water.org. This organization focuses on bringing water and sanitation to the world mm -hmm. through the provision of critical infrastructure and water systems. This is done with the support of a series of global contributing organizations such as the breweries Stella Artois and Pepsi Cola. And if we look at water.org, the work plan of 2019, we see that the major effort in implementing the water agenda, in fact, 
concerns the arrangement with financial institutions. Respond affordable access to water and sanitation. So in this example, through the small loan systems that they call Water Credit Initiative. And then, how are the companies doing? Uh, let me look at one case, the case of a large British-Dutch multinational Unilever. The company has to deal with uncertainties, and in their Sustainable Living Plan 2017, they define areas of relevance and significance, and they call this materiality. This is for issues that matter most to their business and to the stakeholders. And the product that they consider is what they call a materiality matrix, where reducing environmental impact features prominently and the water-related topics rank highest. For the company, this is about improving access to water and managing water use and abstraction sustainably across the entire value chain, from the water pumped up for growing tomatoes to the delivery of the tin of peeled tomatoes to your shop. And what I wanted to illustrate with these examples is a world of complexity and uncertainties in the water sector. And that is a world that you will be facing as a future water expert. This is also a world with a lot of different stakeholders. And one of the Institute's objectives is therefore to further stimulate thinking and acting along the lines of interdisciplinarity, as Charlotte also mentioned in her speech. <clears throat> to broaden your skills beyond the disciplines and to challenge you to use imagination, creativity, and to be open to adapt, to be inspired. And this eventually brings me back to Professor Carmel Bath and his experience of working in and with different groups, including the National Director of Water, the Eduardo Mondlane University, and your own company. Having the competencies, but also the stamina to successfully combine these interests is, in my, opinion, in my opinion, the distinguishing mark of what makes an IHA Delft alumni an award winner. We may be looking here for the future in this audience also for new award winners as they are here in the audience. And uh, I hope that we will find them. So thank you very much for your attention. And we wish you a good evening. Thank you, Johan. Uh, we are getting to the end of this uh, exciting program uh, and this event, or at least the official part of the of the event. Uh, hereby, I would like to officially open the academic year of 2019. Um, I have a, one more uh, uh, announcement to make before we go all down to the canteen for a meet and greet and some drinks and some very Dutch uh, uh, bites and eats. Um, for the embassies who are here now uh, with us, represented here. So in, in a moment I will read out the list of the countries that which are represented uh, by their embassy today. Uh, we request that the ambas ambassadors or, or their representatives, ambas ambassador representatives and students uh, make their way at the table here in the, in the hallway uh, with their flags outside so that you can uh, get to know each other and that you can, can connect to your embassies and embassies to the students that are here from your country. Uh, now to, to streamline that a little bit, I will read all the ambassadors or the embassies that are represented here uh, today. Uh, and, and please uh, find, to the students, find your uh, ambassadors and uh, to the representatives and the uh, ambassadors, the, um, uh, go to your flag, the table uh, with the flag of your country. So 
I read them in no particular order. Uh, the following countries are represented. That's the Embassy of Ethiopia, the Embassy of Sri Lanka, the Embassy of Nigeria, the Palestinian Mission to the Netherlands, the Embassy of Uganda, the Embassy of India, the Embassy of Ghana, the Embassy of the USA, the Embassy of Sudan, the Embassy of Belgium, the Embassy of Chile, of Rwanda, Turkey, China, Tanzania, South Africa, Brazil, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Yemen, Indonesia, Pakistan, Vietnam, the Embassy of the Philippines, Iran, Malawi, and Guyana. I hope that they are all here. They, they, uh, they at least uh, they announced that they were coming. So I, I hope they're all there and that the students can can connect to their to their embassy. So with that, uh, I would invite the embassies and the, uh, the the students to go to the hallway and uh, follow us a little later towards the drinks downstairs. Thank you.